Thank you. Happy Father's Day to, to the fathers, yes. It's, it's really a blessing. Um, I want to share with you uh, what I think the Lord's put on my heart about fathers and about Father's Day. Um, but if you would, uh, I'm going to ask you, those who brought your Bibles, to kind of follow. I've got a lot of Bible verses, um, and, and they're, all, they're all focused on the fact that we love and worship a father. Um, I'm going to have you go to Galatians to start with, but, but, but while you're doing it, Galatians 4-7. It's a scripture that you know well. But I want to I just kind of tie back to something that Scott said as he led us in worship. Um, the, the universe is expanding. And if you've read or studied uh, Genesis, then you'll know what I'm, what I'm about to say. But in Genesis, um, I don't know whether it was six or seven times in the first few verses, the words are in the Bible, it says, God said. God said, let there be light. God said, let there be a firmament. You know, those things. But then later, in that same chapter, he created man and woman, and he said to them. I don't know whether you've ever seen that before. But he made statements, command statements for the universe. And then he made man and woman. And then he said to them. He's still saying things to us. He's a God who loves to communicate with his people. And as a matter of fact, he wants to communicate with you and I much more than we want to communicate with him. No matter what we say, uh, we lead, uh, somebody alluded to it already, we lead busy lives. And, uh, but God wants to communicate with us. He wants us to know how much he loves us. And he wants us to know that each one of us is very special to him. He made us special. Knew us before they created uh, the universe. That's pretty cool. He knew who you were before he made the stars. Well, look at, look at Galatians 4, 7, because it kind of sets up this fatherhood thing. Therefore, you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then heirs through God. Um, I may not have given the, the right verse. What I wanted to, to address, and maybe it says it in another version, but because we are sons, God has called forth the Spirit. And by the Spirit, we say, what? Abba, Father, Daddy. Because we are sons, God has sent forth his spirit into our hearts that we would say, Abba, Father. Now, before I go any further, if you would, let me just pray. Because as I was trying to get my heart before the Lord, I felt like he said to me, invite me. And you all already have. Scott did, Amy did, and with the worship. But I want to pray that. Holy God we ask that your presence would be here upon us. That you would be in us. And then, Lord, that you would speak to us. Come, Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Last night, uh, Sally and I went to dinner. And we went out on the out on the bypass up to 441, turn right to go down toward Atlanta to a Mexican restaurant. Uh, I can't tell you the name, but it's, that's where it is, about a mile down there. And <clears throat> while we were there, <coughs> while we were there, uh, we had a lovely meal, and we noticed, Sally and I both noticed, a young boy, a young, a young man, probably 11, 12 years old, walking around, and he was picking up plates and doing things like that, very unobtrusively, but nevertheless, he was busy. And he came up to us and he said, <clears throat> are you finished with your plates? And we said, yes. And he said, okay, and he took the plates. And the thing that we were impressed by was his studious approach, his looking us in the eye, and, and the way in which he moved. 
It was like, she said to me, she said, isn't that a blessing? And it really was. I, I was blessed. Uh, so so uh, as, as I often do in restaurants and in the, in the public, when I feel like the Lord has shown me something, I, I try to speak out to people. So um, I asked our waiter whose son the, the boy was. And he said, it's one of our waiters here, at, here in the staff. And I said, well, that's, that's pretty cool. He's really a nice young man. And so then I said, would you mind, we'd finished our dinner, getting ready to leave. Uh, and, and I said, would you mind asking the father to come speak with me? And he, he came, this, this, uh, this other Hispanic person. And he, his name was Daniel. Daniel, Daniel, is that right? Daniel? Okay. We would say Daniel in English, <clears throat> but that's what, that was his name. So I greeted him and said, hey, my name's Bill Eubank. I'm from Charlotte. We're having dinner here, and I just wanted to tell you what a blessing your son is. He, and he just beamed, you know, all of a sudden, because he didn't know why I'd called him. And uh, he said, well, thank you, sir. And I said, no, I, I, tomorrow's Father's Day, and I want you to know what a blessing it is to us that you have done a good job with your son training him how to be a young man. And his response to me was really pretty interesting. He said, thank you very much. He's still grinning. He said, my father taught me, and I'm teaching my... Fatherhood. Uh, I'm going to take you through Luke uh, and just, just hit some verses. If you would, turn to Luke 1... 26 through 28, Gospel of Luke. And I'll tell you why, why I'm pulling these scriptures up, because I want you to see them. Um, we, we all know that, that the Lord, the God, God, God our Father, sent his Son to us. And so what I wanted to highlight this morning is what the Father said. And there are several places that you already know where the Father speaks. Uh, first, first, I want you to see in Luke 1, verse 26 through 28. It's the, it's the angel Gabriel that's come down to see this young woman uh, named Mary. You all know the story. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God, it's important, to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. Now, you know, the angel says, you're going to have a child. And she says, how can that be? Look over at verse 34. Then Mary said to the angels, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit, will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Skip verse 26, uh, 36, 37 says, For with God nothing is impossible. And then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it, to me, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. So here we see, even before Jesus was born, we have an archangel being sent to earth to visit this young woman. As you know, he also spoke to Joseph. And he said, uh, God's going God's to send his son. He's going to come through you. And Mary said, I don't understand how this is going to happen, but, but I'm, I'm okay with that. Let it be unto me. So now I want you to turn to Luke chapter 3, verse 21. 21, 22. Jesus then was born of Mary, grew up in Mary and Joseph's home, and uh, came, the time came for him to begin to minister, to begin to share the word that he was, that he was born to share. And so it says in verse 21, Now when all the people were, excuse me, 
were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. And while he prayed, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. So it doesn't happen often that we have it clearly shown in the scripture. But Father spoke. He said, This is my Son. So far from a ministry standpoint, he hadn't done a lot. But I want you to know I am well pleased with him. The next one is Luke 9, 34, 35. And this, this is the story when Jesus took uh, the, the disciples up on the mount, Peter, James, and John, and he was transfigured before them. You all know the story. But I think it's significant to what happens. Verse 34 of chapter 9 says, while he was saying this, that is Jesus, a cloud came. I'm sorry, it was, it was Peter talking. And overshadowed them and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. Can you imagine being there on the, on the mountain and all of a sudden there's God's glory and a cloud comes up and it kind of comes down on you? They were scared. And then a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. So there's almost an echo there of what happened at the Jordan. Once again, here is my beloved son, I want you to listen to him, hear what he has to say. Okay, then I, I, I want to refer to a story that, that Jesus had a little bit later on, it's in chapter 10. You know, he begins to preach or share the message of why he came. The kingdom of God is here. And then in chapter 10, verses 21, 22, he, he has told the 70 to go out. And what I, what I want you to, us to identify with today is that we're the 70. You know, he's told us, I want you to go out. I want you to go to the Mexican rest, restaurant and speak to David. I want you to go to, to Walmart and meet a woman in the aisle that I show you, and then I want you to be willing to speak to her. Because you're, you're part of who I'm sending out. So let me read that. Uh, Luke 10, 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. Verse 22. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son but the Father. And who the Father is but the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. This is so significant. Because... Here we have Jesus saying, the only way you will ever know the Father is if I reveal him to you. Because he's unknowable naturally. You can't, you can't figure that out. You can read the cosmos. You can read, apart from the Bible, you can do all, all you want, but you'll never know who God is unless the Son reveals him to you. And the reverse is true. Only, only the Father can show us who Jesus is. And we know that the operating person in both of those instances is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He's the one that reveals the Father and the Son. And he's the one that I just asked to be here. Do you know how important it is that you walk around every day with the realization that Christ lives in you? Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And so we kind of save that for church. When we come to church, then we're going to be spiritual. 
but 24-7, he lives in you. And he actually wants you to be aware <clears throat> that he lives in you because you never know when he's going to say to you, speak to this person, do this, do that. And last time I was here, I, I actually shared a whole bunch of my family stories about things that the Lord has shown me, said to me, and I'm only going to do one of those today. I, I apologize, but it fits in at the end here. But I want to take you to probably the, the key thing that I want to share with you this morning, and that is in the Gospel of John. I'm switching books. John 19. I love the fact that, that uh, Wyatt can pull that up, and you can see it on the screen. It's John 19, 29, and 30. So we've fast-forwarded through Jesus' life, and he's now hanging on a cross. Verse 29. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with the sour wine and put it on hyssop. There's a wonderful story about the hyssop that I can't do this morning from, from Deuteronomy and how Christ fulfilled that. And, put it on, and he put it on a, this stick, this hyssop, and he put it up to Christ's mouth. Verse 30, and when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and bowed his head, he gave up his spirit. Now, we all have been taught, rightfully so, that Christ came to give his life to save you and me. That's why he came. But then my question to you this morning is, here he hung on the cross, he was not yet dead, and he had not yet arisen. And yet he says these words, it is finished. How could he say that? He hadn't completed the job yet. He was in the process. But how could he say to you and me, it is finished? Because it's the reason he came. So this Father's Day, June the 19th, or whatever it is today, 17th, 2018, Jesus came so that you might know who the Father is. Let me say it another way. Jesus did come to save us. But his mission was to reveal the Father to you. So many people miss that. Jesus came from glory, lived here for 33 and a half years to do one thing primarily, and it was to re reveal to you and to me the Father. Isn't that awesome? And it, to me, it, it is such a remarkable thought <clears throat> to think about that on Father's Day because we celebrate Father's Day as a, as a wonderful day where we honor our fathers as we should. <laughs> Jesus came to reveal the Father. I'd like to close with this <clears throat> story that you heard last time but, but it fits so well and it's the story of my oldest son. I have three children. My oldest son's name is Wes. All three of my children were raised to be Christians, as you all are raised in your families. <clears throat> he was married, and he had three kids. <clears throat> and the enemy got to him. And he uh, had an affair with a young woman older, I mean, younger than he is uh, for some time. And when this happened, it tore our family apart. Um, I don't know whether you know me well enough to know, but I am, I'm, I'm not a pacifist. <laughs> uh, 
I don't take things bad well. I mean, I, I normally find out what I can do about that, and I, uh, I strike out. And I did that with my son. <clears throat> uh, we had crosswords, and he was, he was trying to, thought he wanted to go this way. And here his wife and three children are heartbroken, as am I and my wife and, and the rest of the family. So there was, this, there was this tremendous tension between the two of us. We couldn't be around one another because, not so much him, but I didn't have anything nice to say to him. And so when we were even in proximity, he tried to stay away from me. And I kept crying out to God, Lord, how can this happen? How, how could you do this? How could Wes, <clears throat> how could you allow him to sin like this and, and destroy his marriage? And I was in a bad place. So I'm, I'm crying out to God. My wife and I are we're crying a lot, but we can't make sense of it. And I said to the Lord, Lord, it's just, it's just not right. We, we, your word says if you train up a child in the way he should go, he won't depart. But he did depart. <clears throat> and I had finally gotten to the place where I'd gotten quiet in the Lord's presence, just kind of whimpering. And he said, Bill, how do I treat you when you sin? And I said, well, Lord, you forgive me when I repent. Do you see my religion coming out? And he said, is it just when you repent? Ooh. You see, he stopped preaching to me then and started meddling. And I thought about that. And it broke something in me. I mean, if you didn't get it, the message is, Bill, I love you and forgive you regardless of what you have done. And he said, I want you to do the same with your son. And I said, Lord, I can't do that. He said, yeah, you can. I'll help you. So I called Wes. I was surprised he answered the phone, but he answered the phone and I said, would you meet me for coffee over at Starbucks? I want to talk to you. And there was a long pause because he was deciding whether or not he wanted to go through that crisis. And he said, yes, sir. He said, I will. So he met me at Starbucks, sat down across from me, and you could cut the tension with a knife. And I said to him, I said, Wes, before we begin to talk, I want to say something to you. He nodded. I said, I just want you to know that there's nothing you could do or say that would ever cause me not to love you. He began to cry. That was a turning point. <laughs> That's the point at which he began to change. It wasn't the anger. It wasn't all of the doctrines. It wasn't all of my hollering. It was the love of a father. Father, we love you. And I just want to, you don't have to turn, I just want to remind you of a scripture in one of the epistles of John. It's 1 John 4 8. God is love. That's not what he does. It's not a good day with God. It is who he is, it's his very nature. Isn't that amazing? I mean, we think, well, God, God's God and he can do what he wants to do and so on. But, but the fact that, that he is love and he wants us to know that he loves us and that, and that he, um, he wants us to love others. Even when it's hard. I mean, even when 
You want to pinch their head off. He wants us to love him, love them. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask Amy to come up and sing a song in the background. And I would like to ask all of you, myself included, if you would simply bow your hearts before the Father. And as she sings, normally we sing this with her, but today I'm going to ask you just to be quiet and to let the words minister to you as she sings. Because I believe that what the Lord has shown me is that not so much me, but his message today, the message you heard today, is one uh, that he wants you to meditate on, he wants you to think about. And I really believe he wants to touch you, each one of us. I believe uh, supernaturally, as we bow our hearts before the Lord, he wants to touch us with his Father's love. Be with me. So I'll just pray a quick prayer, and then I'm going to get quiet with you. Father, we invite you to come through your wonderful Holy Spirit and speak to our hearts as we bow, in, as we bow our hearts before you. Would you do that, Lord? Thank you.